This is Matt Brown, host of Just a Good Conversation. It's a beautiful thing to see someone's face light up when they talk about something they love. My guest today's face glows like high beams at night when he talks about a Porsche 912. John Benton of Benton Performance is a special man with a wonderful backstory. We sit down and talk about finding and falling in love with cars, business choices, and his managerial style. That car is part of me. As I know it's an inanimate object, and I know I won't be here to ev- forever. The car potentially will be along, hopefully, longer than <laughs> than me, and maybe who knows how long. The, the car because it wasn't your first car. No, no. But it was your first Porsche. It was. It was like all the other cars were like I was dating, and maybe had some puppy love here and there. But I fell in love with that car. I fell in love with that car. It, it did everything I wanted to do. And once I got it sorted, it just would do it without failure. Um, I ran a lot of cars to failure and a lot of different things to failure. I just really liked that combination. I'm Matt Brown, host of Just a Good Conversation. Take a listen to our archives. We've had such guests who have been awarded the Silver Star, Emmy winners, and business entrepreneur Ryan Ermelin. You've got to have a, you've really, especially in the early, I'd say throughout the business, but especially in the early days, you've got to have that no problem is, is going to stop me type of attitude, right? Yeah, yes. Because I, I, I gave you some small examples. The audio was coming in too faintly. I'm like, oh, what are we, or, okay, great. I can't get phone lines in my grow. Whatever it is, you, you just always have to think, okay, well, there's another way to do it. There's another way to do it. There's another way to do it. And, and, and people are huge. That's why I said bringing this guy on board who had the same type of attitude but new, new technology. You know, when I ran out, when my knowledge base stopped, he could pick up from there and say, oh, we can do this or try this or try that, right? So it it became the point now where I have multiple, another person to brainstorm with. Go to justagoodconversation.com for all our archives. Let's have a quick break for our sponsor before diving into our conversation with John Benton. I have John Benton sitting in front of me. Hola. Thank you for coming by. My pleasure. This is going to be so much fun. I am. I have been wanting to do this for a long time, and I've got you in. And we've always had a good time, so. Yes. There you go. I want to know everything about you that I couldn't find in my research, mm. and then some. So we're going to get right down to the nitty gritty. I will do my best. I love that you're wearing your John Benton Performance long sleeve black T-shirt in here. It's like that's what you should be wearing. Well, this is my standard issue. Right. I, this way, where this is it? That's your uniform. I'm wearing jeans and t-shirts for a long time. If you're taking Iwo Jima, you're wearing that t-shirt. <clears throat> oh yeah, platinum flag, <laughs> pretty much dressed like this. Yeah. How are you doing? Doing pretty good. You know, um, I'll count my blessings. You know, we're all doing what we got to do and adjusting to the, the current climate. Just normal day. Just the normal day. Well, you know, <laughs> I, my sons. You know, we. We talk and the guys in the shop, but I always tell them, look, we do this the Viking way. The Viking way. We, you, you wake up and address what tomorrow brings. That's it. That's it. So, no. so tell me, as a young lad, where did you get that idea? Where did you grow up? I grew up in Southgate, California. Very right. close to downtown Los right. Angeles. Yeah. At the Downey Norwalkish area? No, that would be like where the rich kids lived. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> So, well, Southgate sounds like it should be rich. It's like a South well, you and know, a South, gate. Southgate was uh, the but, edge of the mercantile city that L.A. was, you know, the, the end of where the railroad went, you know, here in, L, you know, in this part of California. And, right. And, uh, but uh, I would say that I grew up in a transitioning Southgate. Southgate was uh, sur- just heavy industry. Okay. Uh, factories, GM plant. Uh, Compton Forge, Schultz Steel, Bell Foundry, and it was a, for me, it was paradise. It was a very, it was mixed racially. Okay. Um, Everybody was what I would call a real middle class. You know, everybody had a new car, relatively new car. Right. Uh, Everybody had a color television. Uh, It was a suburban LA experience. The one that people try to recreate in movies and TV and in stories. I live that. Single story homes, cut grass. Yep. yep. And and apartments. I mean, I grew up. Sure. We we moved a lot. Let's just say that. We can talk about that later. But I grew up in a, uh, what I would consider paradise, but with some twists. And uh, because life happens. Sure. And when you're a kid, 
you just roll with it. Right. You don't know any better when you're seven. No, no. Just doing your thing. Just do your thing. Are you an only child or you got siblings? I have a sister. Okay. Leslie. She's two years younger than me. So you're the... Much better looking. <laughs> Thank God. Yeah. So you're the older boy. Uh, I, am the, I am the golden child, yes. The golden child. Yes. How was that growing up? Well, it's okay. I, let, me, let me just... Uh, I'll be <laughs> totally honest about this. So... Please do. I grew, up, I grew up in California. I came here in 65. Okay. I was born in 63. So my first plane ride was as a toddler. And my mom moved to California to live with her sister. Okay. Who had moved previously to get away from East St. Louis. East St. Louis. That's that, where I was born. That's where you want to get away from. Well, mostly it was to get away just from uh, my, my father was not interested in having children. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I can tell you the story if you want to hear. Let's hear the story. Yeah. So I was conceived in the back of a '56 Chevy. That's confirmed. That is absolutely true. <laughs> okay, my mom, and this is how my, when my mom passed away. I believe in '95, and I actually because we knew the end was coming. I we had these really intense talks, like because I never met my dad. Okay. I never met my dad, so. We had these pretty intense discussions of it, and I really detailed, like, well, what was he like? What was in his hair and his eyes? Because I didn't really know, and I never bothered her about it. Right. right? And she went, She said, please, ask me everything. And so we had this really, really intense communication for a couple months before it wasn't possible. That's good. No, no, I recommend that to everyone. Don't hide. Don't. If your parents are sick or ill, don't squash it. Be part of that. Try to get what you can. Not like you're taking from them, but, you know, you might have questions that cannot be answered later. And you, you have right. to. And if they're willing to share. She held those answers, period. Yeah. And she was totally honest with me. She told me that she, she loved him to this day. Like that moment we were speaking, even though she had remarried and been through. She said she still loved him. to the, She's because I will love him until my last breath. So knowing wow. that she had that bond with him. And that had an effect on me, you know, as a person. Sure. But. Um, I asked her, so what's the deal? How'd you guys meet? And she says, well, I was a poor kid. I lived over in East St. Louis. And in uh, we had, uh, there, in St. Louis on the Missouri side, they had some clubs where they had what was called colored music. Okay. And But everybody wanted to dance to it. So you'd have this right. mixed, very mixed, fun, upbeat, thing and people you know it's just like today you know, people go to raves do that whatever mm -hmm. so my mom liked to party and so did my dad right and it's the 60s and so my dad was like six three blue eyes blonde you know perfect specimen um he was a he was a circle track like dirt track uh motorcycle ra uh, racer right so you got this tall ass skinny dude you know he must have looked hilarious on those <laughs> on those bikes you know and uh and he he drove a wrecker at night. Really? And and during the day he worked at a mortuary. So he he was you know he's always hustling. He's always working, doing his thing. Okay. So my mom said he used to joke that he'd get him, you know, coming and going cuz they people would, you know like die in an accident and he <laughs> he'd pull the car out of the ditch and the next day he's washing them off and getting them ready, you know. So he, she said he had, you know, a fun sense of humor and all that, but long and short of it is that uh, my mom thought my dad was just incredible, my real father. Right. And uh, and she had never been with a guy at all, ever. Like, at you know. Right. And so uh, they end up in his Chevy, and the deed gets done, and here I am. <laughs> so, and I'm glad to be here. Yes. Me. So uh, my mom actually giggled a lot. She goes, you know, she goes, yeah, the first time, you know, I never, I didn't get to have any fun at all. You right, know? yeah, that was it. So, um then she realized, oh, I'm, I'm pregnant. And this is 1962 in a, in a tenement house in East St. Louis. Her dad works on a, my, my grandfather was, worked on a killing floor. He killed cows all day with a hammer. That's, that's quite a, a job, yeah. Okay. And, uh, and he bare knuckle boxed for extra money. Wow. That was my grandpa Nick. So that's a tough son of a gun. Well, and he grew up and he grew up with his sister without parents. They were they came here as immigrants 
uh, Nick, uh, my, my grandpa Nick. and uh, From where? Uh, from uh, Poland. Okay. Yeah. Linky. Huh. <laughs> Linkowitz turned to Linky. Anyway, so um, it, there's all these great stories in the background, but I didn't learn about them until later on, you know, and I had really had to, to press. And, and I actually, after my mom passed away, uh, I went back east to meet family. I just, I just started reaching out. So look, my really? mom. Oh yeah. And I, I went on a pilgrimage. I spent a whole summer back east driving around. What year is this? Uh, 95, 96. Okay. So it's like way that. before like uh, genetic testing or any of that stuff, like 23 and me or whatever. Oh yeah. Well, well before that, which yeah. I also spent a lot of time on later on. It's fascinating what you find at the end of the day. We're all related just so you know. Right. Yeah. There's only six of us. <laughs> <laughs> how are you, my brother? I'm good, man. <laughs> all right. But, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's how I got here. So my, my mom's sister, Terry was a lesbian. Okay. And being a lesbian. Right. Not happening. It's not, you know, and, and grandpa Nick was super conservative. So you're a lesbian, get out of my house, you know? So she moved to California where it was more free and open. Okay. And she got a job at a candy factory. So now my mom is, you know, pregnant. Showing and, so, and pregnant. So sir. she gets kicked out of the house. Into the street. Like, get out of here. Right. But she has sisters. She has six sisters. Six? Yeah. Oh, present. Right. She has seven sure. sisters. Yeah. All, all girls. Jesus. Well, What's... birth control didn't happen. A, no. A Polish Catholic dude Not happening. just makes kids. That's right. what he does. They just, the, that, that, that's it. That makes a lot of kids. <laughs> so so uh, my mom had to go find my dad because he was like, had I maybe heard what was going down and it's like laying low. So my mom found out where he lived because totally different neighborhood. Right. I mean, we're talking miles and miles and miles apart. In the 60s. It's not like you look yeah, somebody up. Yeah, yeah. So she started asking people and, oh, Dave, oh yeah, David, yeah. He lives over on this street. So she goes there, and Grandma Marie answers the door. And here's my mom, like, you know, seven months or so. And she says, uh, can I help you? And she says, I'm looking for David. She says, what's your business with David? Well, I'm pregnant, and it's his baby. And she's like, and now mind you, Grandma Marie is super ultra conservative. You know, this is, these are people that were like, right. this is a serious deal, right? And uh, to them, it was serious still. <laughs> right. So uh, Grandma Marie calls David. David, can you please come up? So he emerges from the basement where he's, <laughs> he has this, like, bachelor set up down there in the basement. And she said he, he just, like, the look, he, he turned white as a ghost. Like, <gasps> and that was it. So he had to sell the car I was conceived in, which was this beautiful hot rod. He was, he was a mechanic. And his father was a mechanic. You know, and I'm a mechanic. Right. But... Uh, I didn't know any of this, you know, no, it's you like, know. it just, it's, there is something to be said for that. It's, stuff gets passed on. But uh, to end this ridiculously goofy and probably very <laughs> common story that people don't want to admit, um, they were, had to get married and he had to sell his car and he had to pay for my birth and he was indignant and made life miserable. Sure. Absolutely. I could see that. Yeah. So my, especially in that era. So my uh, aunt Terry told my mother, look, you're, why be abused? Why be in that environment? You know, don't be, come to California. It's different here. Oh, night and day. It's just different here. And raise, raise, you know, raise Johnny here. I'll get you a job at the candy factory. <laughs> and that's what my mom did. My mom worked on a lollipop line. She made lollipops, like those big, giant lollipops right. with a stick. Yeah. And you could hit them on a table, and they shatter a million pieces. Right. Size of a Frisbee. Yeah. So that's what my mom did at Helen Grace Candy on, uh, what was that, Long Beach Boulevard in Linwood, California. Wow. So there you go. That's Boom, you're here in Cali. So now I'm here, and uh, mom met a gentleman named Leland Rash, and he was a beatnik, like, Probably the, the northern edge of beatniks because it was in the 60s now. Mm -hmm. But he was like a do bears bear to bees be, you know, <laughs> speaking the king's language, tattoos, you know, greaser. Tattoos. Uh, had a 49 Merc, green 49 Merc with uh, gold Appleton spotlights on it, you know. Wow. Mar Marlboro, six, uh, like rolled, rolled up, up in his. Rolled up marbles. Oh, yeah, yeah. Handsome devil. Committed. He was committed to the look. 
No, I mean, he was, because back then it wasn't a look. Right. It was that was a, That was a lifestyle. Now, right. now it's kind of a. Yeah, now it's a look. Like if you, to, this is, okay, I got to say this. <laughs> if you imitate something from a long time ago, that's, that's kind of a, it's cool. I'm not sure. going to say you can't do it, but uh, I guess it's a, an homage, like a, like a, you're, you're paying tribute to that and uh-huh. you like it so much you adopt that. Right. But uh, back then, it was like, that's just how it was. Right. You, there were, you know, there were classes. And if you weren't a rich kid, you were either a greaser or, a, you know, some kind of, I don't know what they call it back then, but you were a nerd. Sure. You know, a you, beach bum, right? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. So he, that's who he was. And, and so that I, uh, and he had a large extended family. So all of a sudden, I went from being this, you know, kind of isolated little kid. Uh, to being injected into this really large family group with cousins and and people my own age and people older than me and I got exposed to so many incredible things and uh, I'm thankful for that because it, who knows what could have happened but right. that, that's what happened. Now Leland was not easy to be around. He loved to do drugs and drink and all that good stuff and uh, we don't have to get into that. But <laughs> That's I gotta Leland's tell you, podcast. No, but I got to tell you, I, it, it was, uh, I had a very enlightening life. A lot of my friends had no idea what it was like to see somebody really intoxicated. Right. Or really high or, or having a dad that's awake for three days Whoa. and then sleeps for three days and you're not allowed to turn on a radio or a TV or a light because if he wakes up. He's just an angry bear. Oh, it's on. He'll beat the hell out of you. Oh, my gosh. So a lot of people don't – people sometimes say, you know, uh, geez, John, because I don't react the way some people react to certain situations. <laughs> mm-hmm. You go downtown or you go places, I see certain things, and, and I'm like, okay, well, you know, not too bad. And other people are like, oh, my God. I'm like, I'm like, oh, that's nothing. You know, it's like, you, know, you haven't seen it. Yeah, I've lived it. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't know how far you want to go through. Well, so, no, did that, so did those early years kind of shape like your teenage years? Well, okay. So, uh, absolutely. Well, yeah, everything. I mean, I, I we moved around. Okay. So, uh, Leland was a skilled electrician. Okay. That's how he made his living. And he came from a family of union, uh, builders. Okay. Carpenters, roofers, plumbers, electricians. The whole family were skilled trades guys. So he had a trade, and it was he, electricity. He had a trade. And, and you know, it was the, ir- the irony of it, it was just, is that his trade gave him the ability to make a bunch of money and then squander it. Oh. And then make a bunch of money and then squander it. So we, it was, I grew up in a fee. I know, I know all about feast and famine when the economy is totally good. Right. Did he make a lot of money because electricians back then were rare and it was very like a specialty craft? Well, okay, so America was expanding and uh, the baby boom from World War II, it just kept blossoming. I mean, and so new homes, uh, new homes and, and building right. and maintaining homes that had been built in the 20s and 30s here in L.A. Uh, required workers. In fact, in 1968, uh, the United States brought in a lot of skilled people from, uh, you know, they had a, a program where if you were, uh, you were Mexican, mm-hmm. right? You're in Mexico, but you're an electrician or a plumber or a scientist or whatever. You, they, you had a, a fast track to get to the United States. Right. Yes, they did. And they brought in skilled labor, you know. They wanted it. They, we, we wanted it. We needed it. So, yeah, you could not not have work. And so it was, I mean, we lived fairly well, but it was a very chaotic thing where uh, when it was good it was good and when it was bad it was yeah so I, I lived in this weird world where you know like when you see a planet when it's like freezing on one side and 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 uh well, and, a lot and, like the moon moon's really hot yeah. and it's really really cold so so let's just say you have this planet where it's scalding hot on one side freezing on the other but in the middle is this beautiful paradise <laughs> so you know you, you you waited for when you were in the middle there you know you tried to I, walk that line yeah yeah and and Looking back, I, I really don't have any regrets. It, it just happened, right? But what happened was, um, you know, uh, I had freedoms, a lot of freedom, actually, because, um, you know, when I wasn't at school, I was on a bicycle or on a skateboard. 
I was with my buddies. We're taping bullets to the railroad tracks. We're right. setting shit on fire. We're we're building contraptions out of uh, uh, like a, we used to have this thing. We called it. You know, he have a, a rickshaw. Uh huh. So not to sound like a racist bastard, but we were all crazy kids, and and I got to tell you, we, I, we it was a United Nations where I grew up, right? But we built this thing. And that's the best thing. Oh, it was so awesome. And we built this thing. We call I don't know why we called it this, but it was the Ying Feng Ching. Okay. And it was made out of a dolly. And dollies have two wheels on one side with a little platform, and you put right. boxes on them, right? It was like a you know a, a hand truck. Right. Right. So a hand trucks have a handle that goes, well, this one, it went right at a 90 degree off of center. And I looked at that. I said, look, if we make a hole in a piece of wood and put an axle, the back wheels are straight. We can put a steerable front axle on this and we can pull it with bikes and do all kinds. Of, and so we built it. What, how old are you at this point? Oh, God, we were like nine or 10. And you were already seeing that. Oh, Yeah. So we built this thing, and and we're pulling it. One of our one of the older kids had a motorcycle. We he's pulling it, and <laughs> and the thing would go out of control, and you just get launched, you know. Right, no helmet, just nothing, thrown into nothing, the street nothing. or dirt. We used to play a game called screwdriver. <laughs> okay, and it has nothing with Ying Feng Ching, but it, this, this isn't like prison shanking, is it? Nothing. So <laughs> oh, so you know, Leland's an electrician, and he had all these screwdrivers and shit. So I, one day. I, I was just goofing around, and I I would take the screwdriver and like throw it at trees and stuff, and throw it in the dirt, and it would stick in. And the other guys are like, "Oh, that's cool!" And so you're you're stupid kids, right? Yes. So in front of San Gabriel Avenue School was a concrete <laughs> entry about eight feet wide, and then on either side is this beautiful grass front yard in front of the the San Gabriel Avenue School, and there's a, a big flagpole. Okay. Okay. So that ended up becoming like a playground for us in front of the school there, and. We would take the screwdriver and we'd separate it into teams. And the whole idea was to throw the screwdriver at each other without hitting each other, but get as close as we could. And to then, the person. Yes. And if and they'd have to take a step back. So we'd start pretty close to each other, like almost toe to toe, and throw the screwdriver in the grass. Try to get just as close to their feet as possible? Yes. Okay. So if you hit them, you had to step back, but you'd hit their shoe, right? But if you got really close, like within like a foot, then that they had to step. Anyways, it's whoever ended up all off the playing field. Right. And oh my God, you'd get a gash in your leg, <laughs> your chest. It's like, oh man, you know. So we did stupid stuff like that. <laughs> or they, and then the flag. We discovered that the flagpole had this rope, you know, for the flag. It wasn't locked up. It had like just a little clasp, right? Sure. And what well, we weigh like what 55, 60 pounds, eighty pounds. We discovered that we could go on to the front of the school, which was a big walkway, a hall area with an open frontage. But that, that rope was so long, oh. we could disconnect it from the bottom of the flagpole, stand on the edge of the rail, and just launch ourselves out. Like pirates off a ship? Yes, and we, and we, would, we could get over the street <laughs> in front of the school and swing around, and then we'd let go and roll. Now, people are in their cars, and all of a sudden, <laughs> you see these young boys, like, you know. Swinging just, over the intersection. Like Peter Pan, <laughs> you know? So, oh, my goodness. Wasn't life fun? It was so fun. It was so fun. I'm, see, you had no idea. If somebody walked up to you and said, boys, you have no idea how good you're having it right now. And then just kept walking. You'd be like, that's crazy. What's that old man want? Yeah, what's that old man? We're just playing with a rope on a yeah. pole. You have no idea, like, yeah. how much fun you've without fear you were having. We... And that is the most precious thing kids oh, can have. We, we had soldiers, little soldiers. Little green guys, right? And, and, and we had model, we'd build models. We had the greatest thing ever. You don't even see them in the market anymore. You'd buy these little balsa airplane kits yes. with a rubber band. Yep. Some were gliders and you launched them. Uh-huh. But some had the propeller. And you spin it with your finger oh, and then like, Oh my goodness, we <laughs> would make those things. And, oh, rubber band guns. Oh yeah. We would make the most elaborate rubber band guns and have the most, the best fights ever. The first time I ever got my nose broken <laughs> was because I shot a girl in her nostril. Okay. Who was, a good shot. Who was not part of our whole deal. Oh, not good. But her boyfriend, these are like high school. So it, it was my, my buddy Latimer's 
older sister, <laughs> and I swung around and I shot, thinking it was somebody coming around the corner, and I shot her from the floor up at an angle. I got her right in the nose, right? And she, you know, she screamed. Of course. And she's like, oh my God. And so all of a sudden, her boyfriend, this guy's like a, a man to me. Right, yeah. He just walks up and punches me right in the nose. <laughs> You didn't right. reload and fire at him? Oh, no. I was like <laughs> watery <laughs> eyes and like, wow, that, that felt really... That man just punched me in the he face. He just punched me in the face. And I got to tell you, I have... We can talk, we collaborate on that because I've had some life-changing experiences directly related to hand-to-hand -hand combat <laughs> with people. I'm serious. Oh, yeah. But... Um, There's nothing like, nothing like being in a fist fight if you want to see... You know, people can complain. We, we talked about this earlier. Everybody's really brave on chat rooms and on, you know, on social media. Yeah. You say it man to man with somebody, and you know you're going to throw down. The conversation gets real, real quick. Oh yeah, I, I, I'm going to be 58 pretty soon. Um, I think I was probably 52 the last time I jumped out of a car. <laughs> and oh, that, a moving car. Uh, it was still moving a little bit. Brenda was driving, <laughs> my wife Brenda, and um, yeah, I, I, if somebody does something really, really stupid that causes an accident, or you know, I'm out of the car. But no, I, that was the last time. I Brenda made me promise not to do it again. Cause Smart I, woman. Yeah, yeah. I, we, we can talk some more, but I. I it's, we'll get to. We'll, I'll put this on Mortal Kombat. Uh, but, but 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 uh, <laughs> as far as like into the teen years. You know, um, in the summertime, I was cheap labor. Right. Okay? So I didn't have a traditional summer most of the time. Most of the time, I, you know, got up at 4 in the morning, get up, Johnny, and ate, like, some Cheerios, you know, real quick. Right. And you jump in the truck, and you're between two dudes, and they smell like beer and Fritos, you know, and you're on your way to the job site. That was it. And, and I, they used me to do crawl work. So I'd get what was called a crawl box, which looks almost like a shoe shine box thing, and throw some straps in there, some scotch locks or you know, wire nuts, uh, electrical tape. Right. I mean, I knew how to do a proper telegraph joint, a proper splice when I was a kid. Like, I got a pair of side cutters, you know, you twist right. it, you know, this how you can trim it, you, and, and after you get done, you get strip done. Strip it clean, make it all nice. Yeah, strip the wire. I mean, I did that. I, I would, they would feed a fish tape to me. I would set the boxes, you know, I'd go in there with, with flex, rolls of flex, half inch flex, three quarter flex, whatever. Or, right. Um, and later on, they, it's called BX, a smaller version, but I grew up as a little, little mini electrician. That's what I did. <laughs> No, I didn't know what I was even doing. I'm, they're like, get underneath there. And they would just tell you, do this, do this, do this. Yeah. And and mind you, you know, when you're a little kid, you're in this dark, dirty space. I, I preferred attics over, you know, under. A tunnel or a tube or something. Underneath. Yeah. And I didn't have claustrophobia or anything. Okay. What freaked me out was, okay, so old houses back in the day, you know, they were made out of much better stuff. Oh, like, yes. Like real two by fours, right? Right. And lath and plaster and knob and tube. So you had wire. No conduit at all. Mm -hmm. And then knobs and tubes as insulators. And so wires just kind of ran around. Yeah, scattered all about in the yeah, walls. Yeah. yeah, and old button switches and bus fuses, stuff like that. So we would upgrade and put new services. So now you got breakers, and, and you, it's all to code. So now you have conduits. and you have all mm -hmm. this. So I would drag stuff underneath there and, and uh, you know, have the, the flex straps, you know, Right. Conduit straps, they look like a, a hook, you know, with a little flat on top. And, you, and you're in a close, so I mean, I'm not a little big kid, I'm a little guy. And I'm you're like, a little guy, and you're trying to bang so, it and so nail in As there. I got older, it was hilarious, because I could one hand swing in a close space and set it with one hit, you know? But when you're little, <laughs> you're like, tap, 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 And now you got these guys outside, what the hell is going on? Down? Hit the gun, and you're like, oh, geez, and, and you, you don't want to piss them off. And you only you know? have 14 inches of space to work with. Yeah, yeah or less sometimes, but... And then, oh my God! Just you guys, you guys know, like when you don't, you can't find your your spot, or 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 Mixie or whatever your pet is, they go under your house or your attic. And Check they, there and, first. And they don't want to be seen. It's what cats and dogs do. I'm just telling you right now. How many dead cats did you see? Too many, too many. 
<laughs> too many. It's the weirdest thing. It's like you have a cat fully complete with what looks like paper. It's the skin. And then all the fur all around it. Just around, dead and falling yeah. off. And it's very peaceful and nice. It's, it's not <laughs> ugly or anything, really, but it's just kind of freaky. And I've seen a lot of that. Everything you can imagine that walks around, I've seen. Oh, boy. Underneath there. And spiders. I hate spiders to this day. And I've seen a lot of spiders. I don't like them. But uh, so I developed a trade that fed me and kept me solid my whole life, okay, to this day. You know, I, I don't call electricians or no, anything. No, you and know I, how to do it. And I help friends. And I can still, you know, by the time I had a career before Porsches, before that. Right. But that you know, being an electrician and eventually becoming an industrial technician, because uh, I, I had a career before I even knew I had a career. And uh, my relationship with Leland devolved. Okay. To a point where we couldn't live together. Because I didn't like the way he handled himself, especially with my mom. But my mom loved him to the very end, just like she did. Your mother's a lover. My once mom was she, a lover. She was a dedicated lady. And Once she loves you, it's, it's, it was on. that's it. That Never again. It. She'll you, love you forever. That's right. And I'm kind of the same way. Kind you of have that way. trait. It's, it's there. I'll take a, quite a bit of abuse before I cut you loose. But, uh, or do you ever cut anybody loose? You always just kind of have a, a little bit of a soft spot like your mother forever? Oh, I think about my mom all the time. Like when I meditate sometimes, I, I do it to remember her face, you know? Right. Um, and to remember certain things. And, uh, but, oh, yeah, I, I'm a softy. I can be an idiot. Sure. And I can let my uh, push the better angels aside. <laughs> and I've gotten in trouble because of that because I, I really had a bad temper. You know, I grew up angry. I was very, very angry. I got kicked out of L.A. Unified in eighth grade. Was a lot of that because of the situation at home? I, th I think so. I mean, you don't even know why you're acting out. No. But I was angry. I was super angry all the time. And I wasn't a big guy. I've always been the smallest guy. Okay. Generally speaking, you know. You know. Um, uh, you were never the six foot three never, blonde, never. No, 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 wide no. guy. And, and not that I wanted to be that guy, but, um, you know, people treat you differently. Sure. And if they think, well, let's, I want to beat somebody up, let's pick that guy right there. Right. So I was a scrapper. For, you know, I would take care of myself. But for a long time, I wasn't even capable of doing that. Yeah, you it know? takes a while to figure it out. Yeah, I, I would just take the hits. And like, why is that guy such an idiot, you know? <laughs> but, but do you think a lot of that was because you didn't have a, a, a great or a stable father figure at home? I would say so, yeah. Because, you know, it was weird. <laughs> when Leland was being Leland, happy, fun Leland, he was a lot of fun. Very giving, very fun. But then, uh, it, you know, it would... It, the bad times over just power oof, it? It would be pretty rough. And see, uh, that, it, even if he was only bad 5% of the time, that bad is just so in, in overwhelming. Well, I kind of what happened was um, inside, I still had hope, right? Okay. That things don't have to be like this all the time. So... Um, what That's understandable, yeah. right? You're but there were other men in my life cousins, uncles, and other wi and women in my life, mm -hmm. like my cousin Denise, um, who were people I held in very high regard. And they, they lived their lives in a better way. And I saw them being more productive. I'm like, well, they got it figured out. So even at a very, very young age, I tend to migrate towards people based on how they treated me. Um, and, and I was also hyper reactive to people that were too nice to me. Because Just I immediately clam on. Well, no, like people. I learned early on that people have motives. They have motives for their actions. You know? Sure. Um, it was weird. I, I really got to see the best and worst of people. I, 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 if I we we could spend five days talking about people, because I saw people that were addicted to drugs, alcohol, people that had mental illness, people that were wildly successful, people that were amazingly gifted, people that that no matter how hard they tried, they were never gonna achieve what they wanted. And I could see it, and I'm like, wow, that's crazy. But um, it, I was a watcher, I've always been a watcher. And, and it served me well, because uh, you know, you, <laughs> more can be taken from someone with a smile on their face if, you're not, if you don't see it coming. Right. So I, I really learned from a young age to really like, okay, analyze a little bit. Read people. Read people, yeah. Yeah, because... And was that maybe because you were reading him? 
what's his mood today? Is he oh, a, absolutely. Absolutely. See, is he good? Is he going to be bad? You, you did not know. You had to like kind of like use the five feet you had to like, am I running? Am I, right. <laughs> am I hugging? <laughs> you know, what's happening here? That's an interesting instinct that you build as a child mm-hmm. and then carry it over into your adulthood to read people. Yes, but uh, the detriment of it was that, believe it or not, I was super introverted. Interesting. As a child. Oh, yeah. I, on the schoolyard, I was a small guy, and I got sick of, like, standing in line for, to play kickball or softball. And being the last one picked. Last or one picked. Yep. And I wasn't bad at anything. I was right. really super coordinated. I was super physically strong. I mean, like, I, I, I love my body. My right. body's been very good to me. And, and But it's kids naturally saying, oh, because he's the smallest. Yes, He's he's got to be the weakest, and they'll pick Fat Jerry yep. over you know little teeny John. Yep, and I, and also I was also a <laughs> pasty white kid. Sure, and so it's just an interesting environment to be in. But um, I was also kind of I was very creative. I loved to draw. I loved to if I could get my hands on stuff, which wasn't always available, but when I did, I used it. You know, I, I loved to make stuff, and I would. I remember at Sanger Avenue, I would. They had like this really cool clay earth. When it was wet, it was cool. And when it was dry, it was super cool. And the trees would drop these little twigs and stuff. And I used to go over there and build little cities and villages and try to keep it from other kids so they wouldn't know. And then inevitably, here comes the bully. Oh, you're, you're a fag. Yeah. And, st- and stomp on everything. Yeah. And then, then the fight would happen. That stupid village. No, but I, I, would, I started fighting a lot, a lot, a lot. And it affected my grades. And, and then people were like, wow, he's crazy. I, right. I got really super belligerent. And, and I think I, I said earlier, um, I got kicked out of LA Unified in eighth grade. From fighting? For fighting. And, uh, and I threw a book at a teacher. Out of just frustration? Well, she, she, sets, uh, she asked a question and I gave kind of like a, a funny answer. And she asked me to grow up in front of everyone. And it just struck me. You and just she, went. And she turned her back to me and I, I'm like, and I, I snapped, I threw, I mean, I was a very angry, angry kid. Right. But there's a bunch you don't know about, so. And it's funny, because now they would sit you down with a therapist yeah. and discuss their, your feelings, and then they'd probably put you on Ritalin, and then you'd be a drooling. Well, I'll tell you, so here, here's what happened. This, I got, 1977, 78 was a make or break time for me, because this is what went down. How old are you? I'm 13, 14. In very important years. Okay. And an event takes place walking down the street. I'm walking home. It's a summer day. And somebody hits me with what I think is a rock in the back of my head. Right behind my ear. And I go down. And I come to my senses and I'm laying in some bushes. Like the, not bushes, but what do you call it? The... Ivy, like Ivy right. that grows in front of apartments. Shrugs or something, right? Yeah. And, and I open my eyes. I'm like, oh, my God. And I touch my head. I got a little bit of blood, but not a lot, you know? So I, I get up, and I walk home, and I tell my mom. Somebody hit me with a rock, and she looks at me. She's, oh, honey, you're bleeding right there. And she puts, like, some Bactine. You know, sporn or something, yeah. whatever. And, yeah. and says, well, honey, I'm, I'm going to make dinner. You go go rest, you know. So I slept. And I slept for like two days, okay. And I didn't feel right. And then my speech was slurred. And I told him, I don't, I don't feel right. She goes, oh, honey. And so I kind of a little bit corrected, but I didn't feel like myself. Now, mind you, something else was in the background before. I had been accepted into something called MGM. Mentally gifted minors. I had been, I was super hyperactive, introverted, but the teachers saw something in me, and I had to go. My mom took me downtown. I got tested, and I had like supposedly this super high IQ, and I ended up in this mentally gifted minors program. And I got all of a sudden catapulted to the front seat of the class. I stayed at school an hour with my other the, my peer group, which was like six other kids in this whole school, and we get to go on extra field trips. And my life was awesome. Okay. All of a sudden, I'm not functioning correctly. My summer, I spent it trying to like look in the mirror and talk to myself because I kept, I was saying like instead of girl, I was saying girl. I'm like, man, what is fuck, man? What's wrong with me? You know, this I'm supposed to be like 
being attractive and, and right. girls and stuff, right? I messed up and I, and I, and it made me even more angry. So I get, I get through and I go back, I, I go back to school and I'm in these gifted classes and I can't get the thoughts from my head onto paper. I'm like really struggling. Can't with, do it. I, I'm like really struggling. So I end up being put in a class Oh no, I'm 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 stepping too far. Okay, so Halloween night. Okay. okay. Shortly after S- September, you know, mm-hmm. you go back to school, right? Halloween night, nineteen seventy seven. I'm walking down the street with my cousin, and this guy dressed in like a fatigue top with long hair, this hippie looking dude, has a old English can and he's drinking and he's stumbling all over the place. And, and I'm like, and I looked at him like, oh, man, I'm like, you should have another, because I always kept my sense of humor, right? <laughs> and I was an asshole. And, I, and I'm, I'm like, wow, you should have another beer. And he says, what'd you say? I said, and I, and I put my hands up. Oh, man, I'm, I'm just playing. And he's like, and he comes at me. And I step back and they used to have, used to see a lot this like St. Augustine grass. It's like mm-hmm. a mat. Yeah. And it can grow a foot thick. Thick and full, yeah. And I stepped back into this. It was a, a cutout around a sprinkler in st- this real, like, six-inch deep. Yeah, a grass hole, right? Yeah. And my foot went in it, and I'm laughing, and I'm stepping back. I was like, oh, and I looked down, like, whoa, because I'm stuck. like, look, and this guy was uh, an art, like, a, he'd just come back from Vietnam, like, or uh, was, a, like, right. still in that place. Sure. Okay? Mm-hmm. And he lost his shit. And he did like a karate kick between my knee and my ankle and just shattered my leg. Compound fracture. What? I fell over. I'm completely like damaged. Like this was like to kill me, right? This guy like totally, this is a grown ass man, like a 250 pound dude. He just took me out. And now I'm laying in a front yard with two knees. I'm in really bad shape. And I was just starting to get back on, like, feeling, but I, so now I'm bedridden. I ended up having to be put back together, and my leg is, now I got one leg different length than the other, and things are really messed up, and I'm I'm going to school on the phone. On the phone? So back then, so when this all happened, my mom went and said, what do I do? You know, he has to go to school, right? And even, even the school had contacted. So they put this phone, it looked like it was from World War II, you know. It's got <laughs> it's this black phone with the buttons on the front. Uh-huh. And it had, uh, and a switch. There was a switch on it. And there was a quarter-inch jack for a set of headphones that looked like Lily Tomlin, you know, right, switchboard you operator. <laughs> I don't know. Some people aren't going to realize what I'm talking about, but uh, you see these old movies of the switchboard yeah, operator yeah. where they're, they're pu- Please punching. Hold. Please yeah, hold. Please hold. Them. I will connect you. And they, yeah, okay, so I, ha- so I have this like antique thing. They bring it in. This lady comes in. She explains how it works. Tells my mom. I'm like, okay, whatever. Oh, I they bet said, you still you wish had that. Oh, that would be a treasure. Well, they take it when you're done. I know. He's... So, so uh, for almost like, like nine months, I went to school. I was bedridden for three months. Wow. Completely. Like, I couldn't move. I was like, they were stabilizing the leg and stuff, and it was a mess, and uh, it was a mess. So I ended up going to school. I would watch Channel 58. Okay. L Unified, they had classes at certain times of the day. Yeah, they did. Wow. Yeah, and, and Channel 50 maybe it was, but right. I remember UHF Channel 58 some, for sure. Yeah. And so, and then I had a folder of classes, and then we had class over the phone. So basically what this phone was set up for was a party line. So I would sit there, and as soon as the red light would flash, you'd push the button, and that was the teacher. And it took a little while to figure it out, but you could push that button anytime you wanted, and whoever was on the phone, you could talk. So I had like 12 friends that I've never met. We shared all of our closest dreams, hopes, wishes. Some of us died because some of the kids had like leukemia or other forms of cancer or, or something going with their heart. Right. And you just had a broken wheel, leg. I, and so I was, and, and 
I really stopped feeling sorry for myself real fast because we're like, what, what, what do you, inf- what, what do you got? It's like being in prison. Who, sure. What'd you do? You know, it's like, I don't know if, I, you know, I don't know if inmates actually ask each other what they do. I, it, yeah, they do. I'm sure. So <laughs> my, my time in jail is limited, but I, I, uh, but, but I had this really weird thing going this on. This little bubble of people you knew. Yeah. And then we would get sad together, like, because we knew. Or like you were leaving the group at some point? Well, everybody had left the group either because you got better. Right. But we would talk about that. Like, like oh, man, my my blood test came back really bad. You know, and we're like, oh, man, it's going to be all right. You know, and we we're really super tight. And then when that person didn't come to class. You knew something was wrong. We knew something was bad. And then we'd ask the teacher. And the teacher would say, well, I'm not, I can't really discuss that. Right. Carol just won't be with you anymore. Yes. And that was a bummer. That was a bummer, you know. What a crazy little group. Like, it was like a little yep. first ever chat room. It or... was. It was like a little little chat group. And we could, and once we figured out we could talk, it, that was very, very helpful for all of us. Right. We would play music for each other. Have you heard this song? Right. Check it out. You know, it's Van Halen, man. Check this shit out. <laughs> so it's like, uh, you know, oh, my God. And we had we had our little mini kiss army. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was, it was pretty good. But I, but I got better to where I went to therapy. And learn to walk again and build my muscles just back and stuff. He crushed that leg. Oh, yeah. He hammered it. And so they were Was able- he ever caught or any prosecuted or no, just, no. just crazy guy goes off into the um, neighborhood? It's a long story, but basically different world, different time. Right, yeah. And, uh, it wasn't an Amber Alert put out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So now I, I go back to school. It's ninth grade. Okay. So I, I, I jumped forward earlier and I screwed up a little bit, but it's all right. I, I end up coming back to Southgate Junior High. Okay. And I can't, I've, I'm so far behind, you know, I was, I was going to start, I was going to start like trig. Oh, you wow. know, in eighth, ninth grade, I, I was advanced math. You were up there. Oh yeah. And all of a sudden I'm like, you know, flowers for Algernon, you know, I'm like, <laughs> oh man, this is bad. And I knew it, something was really weird, but I couldn't put my finger on was it. Was the slurring still there? It got better and better. I, I worked, I really worked on it a lot. And I, um, you think it was a concussion or uh, some no, kind I'll, of, I'll tell you exactly what it was in a second here. Oh. So, so I ended up being put in a, in a two period class in the middle of the day called remedial honors. R- I swear to God, I should get a t-shirt that says remedial honors. You, yes. <laughs> so it was, this, I want one. this really existed remedial honors, right? And remedial honors existed because of the newfound, um, basically marijuana and alcohol. So a lot of really smart kids that were in the MGM program and LA Unified, uh-huh. we got bored really easy and we were very, we were promiscuous in almost every way. Uh, and we were very curious and it was a commonality that we had, even if we didn't have the same kind of personalities, we were very open to almost anything. Right. Okay. But I was very like, I've seen what this shit does. So I was like the straight arrow. So I never would have been a remedial honors ever, but everyone else was there because of that. So here I am in remedial honors fighting to get through this cloud. I'm in not understanding exactly what's going on. Surrounded by a bunch of drug addicts, junior high drug addicts and alcoholics. Wow, that is nuts. And people that had emotional issues. Sure. So you had mental illness, addiction problems. And then me, I'm like, man, I don't know what's wrong with me. And I had my anger issues, right, which uh, had come to play. You know, it's kind of a fog. So I'm just telling you that in that window, that that weird window, a lot of weird things happen Uh to me. And uh, and I didn't know why. But I met my teacher, Bill Crosgrove, in Remedial Honors, and we're still friends to this day. Um, he knew I wasn't one of the drug kids, and, and I was su- still super creative. Like, he did a project where we, he gave everybody access to an 8 millimeter camera, film camera. And he knew I was into photography, because I had built a, I had shared with him my box camera that I made, because I made a, a pinhole camera, mm-hmm. and I used to take pictures on campus. I love taking time exposures with the pinhole because all the, everybody's everything's in focus except for the people. Right, all blurry. Yeah. So, anyways, it's a long story, but um, I still have the creative part was still in there, and and I'm like, really, we get to make a, a cartoon? He goes, yeah. 
And he gave us the parameters, like here, you could do it. This is you could do whatever you want, but I'll help you out. Blah blah. blah. So Stay I, in this framework. Right? I used the chalkboard because I could draw still, and I drew a space launch. Okay. Two frames, modify it. Two frames, modify it. And I made, you know, he he said, "Look, you're going to run out of film, so you got to kind of plan it out." And and I made this really cool. How much time did you have? Five minutes. Uh, if that. Maybe if that. Okay. But, but no, yeah, it's probably somewhere around. But but I I use my time wisely. But I basically just made a, a space launch. You know, it's kind of cool. And then and I changed to a new frame, but it was still in the same thing. Because right. we made it. He showed us what a storyboard was. Wow, this guy's. Yeah. Thinking. You know, he, he's a brilliant man. He's a great man, and he was. He's like the the best uncle father figure dude we we've done some incredible things together nothing creepy you know he's uh, he's a really good dude <laughs> and uh, i've had some creepy things happen we don't have to talk about it but we can if you want but um you know i i uh i thank him very much for saving me you know and uh we need more people like that oh yeah, absolutely that can see a spark absolutely. In a child and- he's a big dude big strapping dude and um and so that garnered respect immediately because you weren't going to play shenanigans. Um, and guys that did, he would, you know, like, oh, we're going to the office. Straighten him out. No, we're not. No, no, you're going to. The... And he wasn't mean. He's not a mean guy at all. Right. But it's a presence. Oh, yeah. But but if he, back then, you know, if you grabbed a guy by his belt loop on the back of his pants and you're, you're big as he is. <laughs> take you all the way. No, you're, he's like carrying you. Right. You know, yeah. all you got is like your balls in traction and <laughs> and you can, and tippy toeing all over the office. So you know, he he handles his his business that way. We need more teachers we like do. that. We absolutely God do. bless him. We need more teachers like that. So, um, he he took me under his wing in a very very. We became very close and. We hiked the Sierras together. We did the John Muir Trail together as adults later in life. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll just, so people listening, if they are still listening and they're not like <laughs> turning this shit off, um, many, many, many years later, I have children. And it's kind of a cold day. In fact, it was a, a cold Easter evening. Um, we had a great Easter. And I even had a fake tattoo of of a rabbit because uh, the, the, these fake tattoos came with the dye kit for the eggs with rabbits and oh, things. Oh, yeah, I remember those as kids, yeah. So I actually put one on my bicep and the kids thought it was hilarious. Little, my kids were little at the time, um, maybe like first, second grade, whatever. So time to feed the dog. So I'm in my bare feet. I got a pair of sweats on and no shirt because I was like in the middle of doing something. Brennan's like, you didn't feed the dog. I'm like, ah, oh, damn it. So I open up the sliding glass door, which was pristinely clean because that's how I kept them. The back window, I like windows clean. I run out in the backyard. Now my daughter to this day is super anal about everything. You don't leave doors open. You, you know, blah, blah. She closes the door. She closes the sliding glass door. I run out, I feed the dog. And I sprint back across the yard because it's cold and I'm barefooted. And I come across the patio face first right into that door. And I break my nose for like the sixth time. <laughs> Jesus. Bounce, it's double pane glass. I bounce off of it. I land. Oh. I, I bounce. And now there's Jesus's face on the glass. I, I could have probably made money and had people come pray right, yeah. in my backyard for years. <laughs> I was that <laughs> this good. This greasy stain. Because I have, I always had like a little beard and stuff in a mush, and it looked, it looked like Jesus, like the shroud of Torin. My wife was like, "Oh my God, it looks like Jesus." So I said, "I, I, so I saw Jesus, babe. I'm telling you, because yeah. I bounced and landed like head and shoulders first on my back, and I get up and I'm, and I'm pissed. And Brenda's doing dishes, you know, because we had some people over earlier in the day. So I'm just laying there, and I'm like, just stung. She doesn't hear you slap. I'm like, wow, the- man. And, and I finally get up, and I walk in the house, and I'm bleeding out both nostrils, and, and you know, my, my nose is just instantly, like, just swollen. My eyes are all tearing up. And she's like, oh, my God. <laughs> was that the noise? I thought the dog was just, I said, no, that was me, babe. And she's like, oh, we have to go to the hospital. I'm like, I think so. I, I, I really think so, because my eyes are swollen shut. <laughs> like, I really... Like somebody hit me with a hammer, like a sledgehammer in the face. So I, How did that grass or glass not break? I mean, that, it, that, it double pane glass filled. Oh. It, it's amazing because if you hit it in the middle, it's flexible. Glass is a yeah, liquid. It's, it's funny how it gives. Glass is liquid for sure. And so I end up 
getting carted off to the hospital and they, uh, they want to look at me <laughs> and fix me and like, we got to do an MRI. I'm like, oh God, I don't want an MRI. I never had an MRI. I don't want to have an MRI. But they put me in the machine and we're, I'm, no, I'm in one of those stupid robes with my ass hanging out and they pumped what looked like a, a soda can full of dye into me. It was very uncomfortable. And now I'm laying in there and I got headphones on like these, like, uh -huh. just so you know, everybody we're wearing headphones. And in the middle of the thing, which is what MRI sounds like, just so you know, it just turns off and I hear a voice. Mr. Benton, can you hear me? I'm like, yeah. Like, uh, what day is it? And I told him what day it was. Well, when's your birthday? And I told him my birthday. Do you have any discomfort? I'm like, you mean besides the noise <laughs> and the fact that my feet are frozen? Um, I, my I'm good. My face is bloodied and I'm... <laughs> you know, and you know, I'm all broken. I mean, they're like, uh, all right, well, hold on a second. Uh, we're, we're finished. I'm like, okay, that was fast. In the segment that they finally got to, an alarm went off. A plume appeared from a ferrous metal object two centimeters into my brain right like there like intersect those lines I'm, I'm pointing at my head right now ferrous metal object in my brain and they don't tell me anything but I get out and then they're like go ahead and get you know get dressed and they're really worried right like I'm gonna drop dead because you're not there for this you're there for your face yes so there's a doctor comes up. He goes, uh, have you ever, were you in the military? I'm like, no. He's like, um, have you ever been shot or stabbed or blown up? And I said, well, I've been blown up and I've been stabbed. <laughs> and, and he's like, well. Can you show us? Like, you, yeah, he's like, where did you get stabbed? Or, yeah. And I, no, he did ask me all these questions. Yeah, I said, well, I, I got stabbed right there. And I got blown up in an in a, uh, explosion from uh, gas in a confined space, like really blown up, like really good one time. And um, but what's going on? He says, well, come look at this. And they got like this little trackball thing with the images. And he's like doing these slices through my head. It's the weirdest thing, man, when you see it, because it's like lunch meat. You know, they're just shaving uh -huh. layers off your face and your skull and everything. And he goes, wait, wait, right here. And boom. And you see this like distorted, weird image. It, it, it was like you could see like the brain and stuff. And all of a sudden, poof, he goes, that is in your head. He goes, um, we're going to fix you up and uh, you need to go see a neurologist. He goes, you sure you feel good? I'm like, I feel great. He's like, all right. So then I end up in a chair with the Samoan dude the Samoan doctor, you never think he was a doctor, but this guy looked like he could just, like, it was like The Rock was his doctor, and he had his real tight sleeves on his thing, and I'm in this articulated chair, and he's sticking these stainless steel bars in my, in my, I've been there before, but I really smashed it good this time. So he gets my nose pretty good and packs it, and uh, he's dripping sweat. I mean, it, he really had to work on it, and they gave me some, you know, anti-swelling shit and whatever. Right. And uh, I just went on with my life. Not the first time I got a broken nose, but I finally go to this neurologist. And he's like, hey, um, can you remember anything? Like, he goes, you have a projectile in your head. And it's broken down. He goes, I'm trying to look at the plume. He goes, we can do a CT scan, but it's not going to give me the, what I really need to see. But you absolutely have a ferrous metal object in your head. And your head is like the ocean. And that thing is rusting and decaying. And just turning into, like, it's, it's dissolving. Right, it's breaking down in your skull. And so now, mind you, we're fast-forwarding, like, 30 years after this event, right? Or 20, whatever, how many years. But um, all of a sudden, the light comes on. I'm Boom. like, son You're of a fucking son of a... Had I known, had my mom said, we're taking you to the hospital, God knows what would have happened. Maybe they would have stuck a, something in my head and made me... A vegetable. I don't know. Sure. But I, so I, I'm like, I know exactly what happened. It, it was like all of a sudden I thought I was damaged and had lost all these faculties and had to work back to where I was now many years later. Um, and all the things that 
occurred because of my anger and all this stuff. And then this happened and I lost so many faculties that I had to build back. And all this, you would, the wave of emotion and curiosity <laughs> and wonder, because I'm a curious, I'm like, wow, this is, whoa. And I told him, I told him, this is what happened. I think some kid shot me with a BB gun walking down the street because this is what happened. I t- kind of told him, not as elaborate what I'm telling right, you, but yeah. I said, I've had some weird things happen to me. And at the time, I was a facilities engineer and I was designing equipment and fixtures and writing technical documents and very computer literate. And I built my own computers at the time. You know, I, I, I kind of got my act back together. But my wife, I would have to ask her once in a while, I'd have these episodes. It's the weirdest thing ever. I, it's h- really hard to explain. I see your, that journal in front of you right there. Mm-hmm. I would write in a journal like that and then go back to it like a week later. For reference? just to- And I'm like, I didn't write that. I didn't write that. And I'm like, wow. I'm like, Brenda. And I would freak out. I'm like, Brenda, that's my writing, right? She's like, absolutely. I'm like, that's the weirdest shit. And it would happen. It, it doesn't happen much anymore. But... Um, as this thing decayed, I would have like mini strokes. They didn't remove it? No. So the neurologist told me where this is in my head had to do with speech, which made total sense. Yeah, sure, now. And he said, but what's happening is, he goes, uh, a br- brain is resilient to some extent. So he goes, you got lucky. What it looks like is it, it went through in an area and went between a low, like, uh, he says, your brain looks like a... It's got all these folds and convolutions, mm-hmm. right, yeah. convolutions, in it. and he said that object went in to a fold, into a fold, and went pretty damn deep, and you had a brain bleed, which was like a stroke, and you were young and strong, and luckily you went to sleep. You didn't run home, you didn't bleed out in your head, you the your body did what it had to do, and it. it clogged the bleak, but you had a stroke, basically. And that stroke followed you, and it's been following you to this very day. He says, we cannot go in there and do anything about it. He says, the amount of damage it would do would be catastrophic. He says, the fact that you're mm-hmm. functional. Removing it would be more damage. At yes, because he goes, what we would be probably going in there and finding is rust, which is very much like your blood. He says, well, so what happens when you have a stroke or an aneurysm, you bleed into your brain and it short circuits it because of the iron content. It just short circuits right, everything. Yeah. He goes, so what you have is this thing, there's probably some kind of shell around it. It's this right. debris or now. Or pellet, whatever the hell it he is. He says, so it's going to continue to break down and it's just part of who you are, but it's not going to kill you. Wow. So, and this is several, this is a long time ago. Right. You were a kid, 13. Now you're a grown man with children. Now I'm a grown man with kids, and I'm in my 30s or whatever. So it's 20 years later. And so now we're another 20 years later. And uh, and I worked in some pretty crazy environments, you know, and a lot of responsibility. Does it ever go off like a metal detector or still no, bother it's, it's you? No, it's just or? too small. I mean, now it's just gone. You can put a pocket full of BBs in your pocket right now and go to the airport. They're never going to see them. If they do one of those scans... They'll, they'll see it. Like, what is that? Oh, it's little BBs. And what are they going to do with them? All right. You know? So. But um, is it, have you had it checked? Is it like still there? Is it gone? Is no. It, I mean, the neurologist it, was really kind of like, look. He goes, keep an eye on it? No. No. He just says, you know what? If something happens, you know, you got your wife. Um, they considered making me wear one of those uh, wristbands since I can't have an MRI. Okay. Like a medical alert kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah. And I told Brenda, I'm not wearing one of those stupid bracelets. <laughs> No, if I end up, if they put me in MRI and it squashes me, uh, too bad. But I have a feeling that if I'm in MRI again, it's going to be something really bad. So I, I'm not worried about it. So I don't wear one of those stupid bracelets. But so uh, I did, I, science is wonderful, right? We have all this technology and all this stuff. I got one of those titanium posts okay. a couple years ago, Uh huh. like a year ago. I got one of those titanium posts to put a tooth on. It's Really amazing, awesome. <laughs> Takes a while to do it right, but I'm that technology rocks. 
for me. Don't do the quickie one, guys. Do the one that they put a post and address a tooth at a time. That, that works really well. Um, but anyways, I uh, had to go in for that, and they wanted to do a scan of my head. I said, I can't, I, I can't do MRI. And he's like, we'll do a CT. I go, will that affect medics? No. So I had a CT scan, which is even more crazy. You're in this, like, this chair with this thing. You Spins can hear. around oh, you. Oh, man, yeah. it's incredible. It's so Star Trek. It's awesome. So they do a CT scan, and I asked them, hey, can you go up, make sure you get – and the guy's like, well, I guess I can't. Like the, this is the – not what is it, the uh, radiologist guy. I, I, I want to see something. So he, he shows me the scan, and there's no longer – anything really noticeable. Uh, the, uh, actual, you could see an object. It's not there. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's like more like a nebula cloud. Yeah, it's broken down now. So I think whatever, whatever gifts that gave me and whatever maladies it was giving me, it's become a non-issue. Now, once in a while, I do have a little slurring, and it may happen while we're talking, but it, it's still, it's a weird thing. It affects... It's weird. I can't explain it. But for a long time, there were a lot of mysteries that I had no explanation for. There you go. Your daughter doesn't close that screen or that sliding door. Yes. Here. Nobody knows. So I know it's a crazy tangent, but that definitely affected me as a person. Sure. All, everything, you know, we all have our things to deal with. But, I, man, I don't know where to go from there. But well, I that's mean, pretty wild. Yeah. But you get your act together. You get through... High school and the, well, I, the, yeah, BB's, so, the BB's still in your head. So when I was, uh, I had by the time I got to high school, I, I by the time I got to my junior year, I, I started to roll pretty good. You know, I was like, I got this, and I had my little Volkswagen that I had painted a house so that's, to get. That's what I was going to ask because I, you're a car guy. Yep. Where do cars fall into your life at this point? Are you that four, fifteen and a half year old boy waiting to get your my permit? Ca my car was my house. Get your. Get a car at sixteen. Yeah. Are well, you just? Was, were you looking at looking at it as time? When do I get a car? How much does it cost to get a car? Well, I uh, I got my I got my first ticket when I was fourteen. Joyriding, a '64 <laughs> Impala. Who's Impala? Uh, Leland's Impala. Oh, of course. And how did uh, that go down? Um, a policeman on Tweedy Boulevard pulled up next to me and asked me how old I was, and I told him I was old enough. And he said, pull over. And I pulled over. And I get out of the car. I'm a midget, you know. And he's like, he's just shaking his head. Probably just saw eyes over the window. Yeah, huh? yeah. I, I could barely. I, mean, I was sitting on the edge of the seat, you know, tip, you know, just barely able to touch. Tapping the gas. It's a big bench seat, you know. It, oh, yeah. It's got this, you pull it forward, it glides with effortless glide. And then you just, right. And I've got the wheel, and I'm doing my thing. Automatic, but, you know, it's easy to drive. <laughs> so he's like, where do you live? I said, I live on Alexander. He says, I'm going to follow you, drive home. So I drive home, use the turn signals, pull up, park the car in the driveway, put it in park. I get now, out. Now, where did you get this confidence to feel like you can drive? Well, when, when uh, Leland's family was huge. Okay. And I had all these fun cousins. And sometimes, in, sometimes we'd go back to Texas for family reunions. Okay. For the Green Haws, the Rashes. They're all farmers and crazy people. They like to drink and fight. And I mean, like. Good Texas time. Oh, my God. I, I can, <laughs> some of the best fights I've ever seen were not on HBO. It was like Uncle Dale and Grandpa Don, you know. Like, Going at it in the backyard oh, over something. Knife fights. I mean, like, I'm telling you, I've seen some incredible things. People don't, <laughs> people don't know what it's like to be really alive. You watch these shows, like, with Vikings and shit. Uh, <laughs> when people would raid your village, I mean, th this what th this is this is who they are. It's just different era. <laughs> well, it is. People have no idea how comfortable it is. It, we are we are so trapped in our little TV world. But anyway, nobody I, raids your village anymore. We right? hope not. Right? I mean, no, nobody like you don't look in the distance and see ships, and you have to start blowing your horn yeah. and gather up, yeah. you know, yeah. everybody and take the women and children, and yeah. send them to the hills. It's pretty wild. <laughs> But without making this all about this crazy whirlwind childhood I had, I... I but that's what shapes us. It, it, it is Our what shapes us. Our childhood shapes us. Yeah. So, so in Texas, you learned how to drive? Yeah. So so I learned how to shoot guns. I learned how to fight. I learned how to drive cars because they would just take one of the cars 
Like one of the kids would grab keys because all the adults are so drunk they can't even get out of a chair. Right. And they're and they're listening to old timey music and dancing right. and stuff. And we'd go out, we'd get an Impala or Bel Air or Ford truck, and now we're doing donuts out in the field and laughing our asses off. And like, come on, Johnny. And I'm like six years old, like, and they're working the gas and I'm working the, the steering wheel, <laughs> you know? And and everybody's like, oh yeah, and I'm just turning the wheel and turning the wheel and and then all of a sudden, now you got a gun in your hand, and you're like, oh, shoot that bird, you know? And the first gun I ever shot was a 357 Magnum. How did that not come back and take your head oh, off? Oh, it, it almost flew out of my hand. <laughs> and like, I was like, because they said, hold it, hold it, Johnny. And I'm, I got a death grip on that thing. I could barely pull the trigger. It was pretty oh, hard. Heavy to pull. hammer, yeah. And so I think, I think, I think my Uncle Bob actually. Cocked, cocked it back it for you? because I couldn't make it go, and they're all laughing. And there was this: the first time I shot a gun, I killed an animal. It was this big black crow. It was on a fence post, and like, shoot that bird, Johnny. And crows are funny because they're like, just like looking, like you know, right, staring at you. Yeah, yeah. Some you some dumb. animals they don't give they don't give right. crap, and they don't. And this bird obviously didn't realize what was going on and I just looked down the length of that barrel and I pulled the trigger and all I was like whoa and I, I didn't even know what happened but they're all like oh they're like cheering and stuff and then by the time I looked all I see is like feathers in the wind you know I'm like oh man <laughs> and, and someone's trying to grab the gun out of your hand oh yeah, probably... oh yeah absolutely absolutely they, they had a gun on it. and then I think the second time I shot a gun was a giant shotgun like a 10 gauge goose gun in a trash pit in New Mexico <laughs> Jesus. You know, they're all drinking beers and they all, all these guns and stuff. And they like, here, Johnny, shoot this gun. So here I am standing there. I'm probably like eight years old. I got this big goose gun. The goddamn barrel's like. It's probably looked, as long as you. It was hilarious. And they were all just wanting to see what was going to happen. And yeah, I, you're the entertainment at this yeah, point. Yeah, so I shoulder that gun. I know how to shoot a gun, you know. And so I shoulder that gun. Oh, my God. I must have flown back three feet, landed in the dirt. And these guys are pissing themselves laughing. Just oh god damn it! You know, yeah. That's the kind that's of the best thing I've seen all day. <laughs> slapping their knees yeah. and laughing. That's the environment I grew up in. Right. Okay. And it's not for everybody. <laughs> no, it's not. But damn but, it, it, it is some unbelievable great memories of those yeah. kind of things. So, and then you come back to Southgate, and and none of these kids know what's going on. They have no idea. No, no. But clue. and you want to share it with them, and their, you, and you their tell life them is only Southgate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't know what it. You know, yeah. field in Texas even looks like. Nope, no idea, no idea. They've never seen the a storm, right? A horn swoggler, <laughs> real lightning a, a in the distance. Strangler. Yeah, lightning in the distance <laughs> coming your way, and you could just see it light up clouds on the on the plains. Yep. They didn't know what it was like to be called a piss ant. <laughs> um, but but all these things shaped me, and 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 it was. I, looking back, I mean, there were some bad things, man. I, I got to tell you. I got to tell you. I, I saw some really crazy stuff. Um, I seen the evil stuff men will do to each other when they're mad or drunk. Oh, sure. I seen people just about get ended. I mean, it was bad. And um, uh, But, you know, I, I, I told you my relationship with, with, uh, with Leland had devolved. And a lot of it, some of it was because of cars. I really wanted a car. And I got caught joyriding his cars a couple times, okay? And that time I got that ticket, mm -hmm. they had to go. We had to go to Norwalk to the juvenile court. And mom and dad had to, like, go before, like, a DA or a judge or something in this little room because I was out joyriding a car. Right. Like, I was a delinquent. Like, aren't you watching your kids? So it wasn't all back then. Like, there were still laws and rules, oh, you know? Oh, sure. So... Um, I wasn't like the kid that was sneaking alcohol or um, snorting stuff or doing just bad things, you know, looking in the medicine cabinet. I wanted to drive. I wanted to draw. I wanted to blow shit up. I, I, I was have that was where I was at. And so. Um, but what what caught your eye about a car? So car to me was like this this freedom machine. Right, because we went all over the place. Those trips to Texas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, you know, almost getting washed off the road in Cloudcroft. That was in a car. And then also, I got all these cousins, and they all had fun cars. And all the and, so, and you got to remember, like when your cousin is uh, 
a plumbing foreman, he's making doctor money. I, I, I can't explain it to you, but if you've got a cousin that you're tight with and he's got a orange Porsche 69911S, which was the case, that, I'm like, man, that guy's a badass. You know, like, so like my cousin Mike, he played tennis. He's, he had like the perm, the gold chains, always rolled around with, a, with Bacardi and Coke in the Porsche, in the little pocket, and he had a glass on the other side. And he'd roll around, no ice. Bacardi and Coke between his legs, driving 911S, and just slaying the chicks all the time. The guy always had a spoken babe and the best cassettes, you know, eight tracks, whatever going, and just super cool dude. And I wanted to be that. I'm, I'm not gonna lie, I'm like, I wanna be like that dude, right? And uh, my cousin Max, his, his cousin, right? He, they were both like football players, you know, and, and uh, Max was more, and, uh, more of an empath, so, a rock, I mean, the guy was a rock and could twist your head off, but he was a softer, kind of gentler dude. Mike was a, a like, don't mess with me because it's, it's on. But they were best buds. And I looked up a, to both of them for the best qualities, you know? Sure. And uh, I knew I wanted, a, I wanted uh, Max always drove a Volkswagen, and my cousin Denise always drove a Volkswagen. And I hung out with my cousin Denise all the time. Whenever I was little and everybody was doing stuff, partly because she had to have a chaperone to go to the beach and stuff. Okay. So there was, well, take Johnny with you. Because when you got this little boy with you, it's harder to get into mischief. Right, absolutely. So they still got in mischief, and I was right there. I, <laughs> I saw wild, orgy-like pool parties, <laughs> and I saw people rolling joints and just getting destroyed. and and But nobody getting hurt, just having a good time, mm -hmm. right? So I never felt in danger. In fact, oh, my God, these girls would be on me, like, oh, he's so cute. Oh, right. They were motherly taking care of yes. you. They wouldn't put you into the trouble. Exactly. Isn't Nobody's that... like, here, smoke this joint. That, right. that didn't happen. No. I got to tell you. They wanted to make sure you were taken care of. Yes. I, I, put, no, watch TV, have some cookies. Everybody thought lucky. you were adorable. They were like, here, drink this joint. They, nobody did that to me. Thank right. God. Right. That wasn't part of the experience. So, Isn't uh, that funny, though? Like, all these girls, and they just thought you were the cutest little thing. Oh, my God. And they just wanted to take care of you motherly. And then they'd go out and dive butt naked in the hot tub oh or my pool. God. It was so funny. So <laughs> Mike used to call his girlfriends, all right? He'd call his girlfriends, hey, Johnny, come here. Come here. T tell Becky hi. And you got a little kid voice. Right. Hi, Becky. And they're like, oh, he's so cute. And like, and he, he would, like, put his hand over the phone and go, Johnny, tell her she's a stone fox. <laughs> I'm like, you're a stone fox. And like, oh, my God. So... He would do that to get in girls' pants. Right. So I was like this tool. So the parents like, oh, use Johnny to like stay out of trouble. No, no. I was used like this ornament, you know, like check it out. Mm -hmm. So a little toe-headed kid, you know, little freckles on his face and stuff. But uh, I wanted a car. I wanted to experience all this great stuff they were being able to do with cars. And, uh, you know, I, I'll tell you a funny story. I, I, uh, we went out pretty far away from the house to go to like a Thanksgiving dinner or something. And uh, my cousin had a friend had this little Honda, like a tiny little Honda. Like when Hondas first landed, mm -hmm. this tiny, tiny little Honda. And I remember sitting it, uh, seeing it in the driveway. And I really like, because it looked like a toy. Sure, that was, yeah. You know, we, we arrived in like a 69. That little, little two-door hatchback, that just a little teeny yeah, thing. Yeah, like, like a, a black rubber surround on the back, like right. a weird back window. It looked like a toy. and Because I think we arrived like the 69 long back Impala, <laughs> you know. It was like a yacht. A block. <laughs> and so I remember sneaking out away from the party, and I went out there, and I must have been, I don't know how long I was in that car. But you were fascinated, weren't you? I was fascinated. I was. I just sat next, and it was so small that I kind of like, wow, things are kind of, excuse me, things are kind of closer. And I remember this stupid little Honda car being, I fell in love with that car. Like, I dreamed about that car, and I never saw that car again. That was the one time, like, like it was like a one-night stand with a beautiful woman. But that was it. And she was like, in your mind forever. But, and I, I can... That car I, touched you? That car touched me. And... And I haven't told, really told anybody that story, but I remember that because because we're talking about all this young, I'm right. thinking about stuff I haven't thought about in years, but um, I remember really like falling in love with that car. 
And was uh, it the shape, the size? Just, it wasn't American, so it looked a little yeah, different, a little roundy, you know. And, right. And the interior because they came around. That we're, yeah. we're still very straight lines, Absolutely. hard chrome bumpers. Mm -hmm. uh, lights were very aggressive on the grill. This thing was like Japanese. black and orange. Yeah. Like a 911, when, when you know, when like right. a Porsche is black and orange, it looks also, really good. The Japanese cars in those early years were different colors. Yes. Their colors were a whole different palette than ours. Yeah. And so absolutely. that helped. Sure. So that had a big effect on me. And then I spent a lot of time in a Volkswagen Beetle. Who like had that? My cousin Denise. Like, okay. Uh, and, and I spent a lot of time in that car, bouncing around, holding on to the little hand grip. That's in front of you there with both hands because you got little hands. Right. And uh, what year was that little beetle? Uh, I think it was a. I think it was. It was brand spanking new. It was like a '68 beetle in 1967. Wow. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. So that's crazy to think. Like you were in a. Uh, to find that beetle now, it's difficult, but you could find it. But you were in it when it had. 10 miles, like oh, a new car. A new car smell in a Volkswagen. Right. It's different than a new car smell in a Chevy. I, I, I know the two smells. Yeah. Yeah. That smell, that leather, the plastic, the material. Leatherette, baby. Yeah. Right. The carpet on the floor. Well, they had the coconut husk as the sound. The, the materials they used where they built that car were different than the materials they used to build an American car. Right. And, yes. And same for a Japanese car. So... Uh, so they had their own little distinct smells. Sure, sure. So, got car buffs, you're gonna hear me right now, and you're gonna know that you know when you're you find your little barn find and stuff. There's that initial like, oh, yep, that's an old port. Oh, that's an old Nissan. Oh, that's an old Fiat. You know, so right. Did a Chevy and a Ford have a have a certain smell back then, or were they because they were using the same materials? They smelled American. I, I would say they were very much alike. Yeah, they had that American smell, Absolutely. but not an, a, an Italian the or way, a the, Japanese. Yeah, the way the American vinyls degassed. And the adhesives and the different, it's, it was different for sure, yeah. That's crazy. And, uh, but I, oh so my goodness. So that starts your slow and so, roll to automobiles. Yeah, so I'm in Southgate. But, Southgate was a car town. Tweedy Boulevard was a cruise boulevard. I was going to ask you, is that Whittier Boulevard-ish? A lot of cruising? Sure, so you, you might cruise Whittier and Tweedy on the same day. Right. Until the cops shut it down. Showing cars, looking for girls. And the, the end of Tweedy Boulevard, uh, for all intent and purposes, was... Atlantic. Okay. And Atlantic's a main thoroughfare. It connected from Long Beach to East LA. I mean, all the way up, and then it turned all the way up, shit, all Pasadena, you know, or Gardena, not Gardena. Uh, Glendale? Oh, Glendale, no. yeah, like yeah. Glendale. So uh, that was another thoroughfare that was kind of fun. And all the drag racing was on Santa Fe. Okay. Over, over by, there was a, a real quarter mile with no cross traffic, you know, on Santa Fe over by the GM plant. Because wow. they had a huge parking lot. So that's where the fun drag racing really happened. Um, but I was in love with cars, and I joyrided all by myself. This wasn't with buddies or nothing. This is, I just wanted to be in a car. Um, I had some great experiences with cars, like most people have that first are in car? cars. What's your first car? My first real car was... A, now, why do you say real car? Because I had... Maybe joyrided or borrowed stuff. But no, I mean owned. The, the, One that was John's the, first yeah, the, the real car. Fir the first real, real car I owned was a 59 Volkswagen ragtop Beetle, ragtop sunroof. And I painted a house to get it. How much it cost? Uh, well, it's kind of a crappy story because I got ripped off. Cause I, Just know, throw me out a number. What do you? 600 bucks. Oh, my God. What a, that's great. That was way too much for that car. Of then. course it was, but still... Like trying to get a kid to buy something six hundred dollars now, you would be you would think it's unsafe. <laughs> well, it was kind of a crappy story because it was it was my aunt, my aunt, my aunt Kawana. Mind you, these are people from Oklahoma and Texas. Kawana, that that was Aunt Kawana. She, she had kind of abandoned this Volkswagen at my grandmother's house. Okay. And I and I used to go sit in that car, and I really wanted it, and I was like fourteen or so. And I told my grandmother, I want this car. And grandma was Mambo, just so you know. Okay. Her name was Ira, Ira Tira Greenhaw. <laughs> but we called her Mambo. Great names. Okay, I'm just saying, this is a different world. So I asked Mambo, I said, Mambo, can I get this car? She goes, you're 14 years, you can't reach the pedals. I'm like, well, I'd really like to get this car. Well, if you paint the house, you can have that car. It's not even her car. 
I don't know this. I'm just like thinking it's in her yard. So it must be so hers. It must now. be hers. It's been there I for remember, a while. I remember Aunt Kawana driving it, and Aunt Kawana <laughs> was out of her mind. You know, she was like a crazy party lady. So I spend my whole summer, and mind you, you don't just paint some old person's house. I don't have any skills either. I mean, I haven't painted a house. I'll wire the damn thing, but I can't paint it. She takes me out there. She's got like a, a torch, this hand torch. And she's like, okay, you got to heat the paint. And when it gets soft, you scrape it off. And then after that, you're going to sand this. And then you're going to take this oil. What kind of oil? It's like, something like Neat's foot oil or some shit. I, I forgot what it was called. Oh, God, I'm sure that and, wasn't and poisonous. I, and I had to hand rub all this wood. You know, This is just a trim, right? The house is stuccoed. And it has some wood trim and all around the window stuff. But she's like, that's how you're going to do every single one of these. Man, this is time-consuming, tedious stuff. But I'm pretty focused, kind of, and I got into it. So, I mean, I'm in there heating up that paint, scraping it off, sanding it. There's, like, some putty. And then I get it all smooth. Sand, and then I put this oil. And then enamel paint, oil-based enamel paint. And this stuff is like glue. You know, you got oh to you gotta stir it up. With it, and you're breaking paint sticks off. I'm like, man. And then you got to brush that stuff on, you know. And, and then I – but anyways, I painted the house, did all the trim. It took the whole summer. The whole summer? The way well, – all I had was, like, brushes – you know, I don't have a sprayer or anything. Right. And, and, uh, and uh, like, rickety old ladders and shit. And, and then <laughs> Jesus. on the top of the house, it had these, like, little window things coming out of the side. This really high peak roof. We, I don't know what they're called. The architect will know. But these little, like, little mini houses sticking out of the side of the roof with windows in them, you know? Uh -huh. Just for decor decorative purposes. They serve no purpose. <laughs> they're just there to, so that you can spill paint on the roof and get in trouble for it. Because that's what happened. I just spent, I spilt, it looked like bird shit, but she made the biggest deal out of that. And I had to figure out a way to fix that without removing the shingle. So I, I literally, because I was a model, I built models. So I, I just, I mixed paint to match. To match a shingle. And I was like stipling it, like little gray and black. And, and I, you couldn't tell. I, I actually fixed that. But anyways. She so, must have had good eyesight to notice that. Oh, I have really killer eyesight. <laughs> no, her. Oh, her? Oh, shit. She was half blind and she could see it. <laughs> but she was, but uh, I, my 15th birthday happened. Now, mind you, I'm dealing with all this other crap. My, these things that happened to me, I recovered from the broken leg. And now I'm crawling on a goddamn roof. <laughs> okay? I, I'm crawling on a, after all this therapy and shit, I work, work through all that. I, and now I'm fixing it on the car. This car is everything to me. This is like the guy who gets stranded on the and island with the goat. you have no clue it's not even her car. So, so I, no, I don't, I'm ignorant. I'm a dumbass. <laughs> I'm a dumbass. I'm smart in some ways and the stupidest guy on a, in the universe and others, you know? And, and so it's always the things you don't know. You don't know. Of course. Really yes. get you. Even as, at this moment, there's so much that we don't know. Absolutely. But, but we don't know it. But we don't know it. <laughs> ignorance, so we're not dumb, ignorance is bliss. I guess. <laughs> so I... <laughs> I finish, and I do this remarkable job, and the house looks amazing. You know, she made me put tarps down and fold those damn tarps every day and put them away, go out to the shed, make sure every can was sealed. I did it, and it took the whole summer. Like, there's maybe a week left of the summer. So I'm like, can I have the car? She goes, well, you got to get a license. You got to get insurance. You know, you're not even old enough to have a license. I'm like, well, no, but I can work on the car. Well, well, and you know, you work, you painted the house, but I, I got to get some money for that car. I'm like, how much? And she says, six hundred dollars. Now, mind you, that car was worth about hundred dollars back then. Okay. Easy. Yeah. So I go get a job. You have painted a whole house. Yes. And you still need to come up with six hundred bucks. Yep. So I. She got, owes you about fifteen hundred. Well, <laughs> well, I had some money put away. Just a little bit, because I had saved. But I ended up, I got a job working uh, part-time at the hobby shop okay. on Tweety Boulevard. And and I did some electrical work on the side. I shit you not. I, I did some electrical work for people. And they're like, you're going to do what? I said, I can fix that. I can fix it. Anyways, I, I finagled away. And within six months, I had enough money to buy that car. And... 
I started taking driver's training because you can get your permit at 16. Uh huh. So I did everything. But here's the really cool thing that happened. On Atlantic, just off of Tweedy Boulevard, was a place called Tony's Auto Repair. They worked on Volkswagen, Porsche, Mercedes, and BMW. Anton Buchler, the man who started Tony's Auto Repair, worked at Competition Engineering, the Competition Engine, uh, the Competition Motors, I'm sorry, Competition Motors in LA, where James Dean got his car. You know, that was the one of the premier Porsche places in LA. And he broke off and opened up his own shop in the early 60s in Southgate. This guy could do four cams, everything. This guy was a legit Porsche dude, right? And uh, like he worked on like Johnny Von Neumann's car and he did race support. He did all kinds of stuff. But the, uh, but ultimately he just became the guy who owned this little shop in Southgate. Wow. And it was a family affair. So Adam and Adam's wife, Herta, and Franzela, Frank, and all these cool Austrian and German dudes who came here on a program after World War II, lottery system, they landed here. And Adam, pretty much by the time I went there, was like the main dude. Uh, Anton kind of was getting older and retiring kind of sort of. Passing it on a little bit, yeah. But I knew of that place, and I knew there were always Beatles and stuff there. And so I gained control of the car, and it was a mess. You know, pedal to the floor, <laughs> uh, carburetor frozen. And I didn't know a whole lot about cars, but I had an idea of, like, okay, it's the stuff's here. So I would get on my bicycle. I got on my bicycle, and I got a bag, a paper bag, and I put the carburetor in a bag, couple of bags, double bag, you know, took the carburetor off the car and I rode over to Tony's Auto Repair. And I get off my bike and it's a bright, shiny day in this white building with a big door. And so, you know, when you walk from a bright, shiny summer day into a dark building? Takes you a while for your eyes to adjust. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I didn't read any of the signs. I just walked into the void instead of the office where Herta, Adam's wife, was. Sweet lady. I walk in, and he just comes out of it. I'm like, whoa, and I almost run into him. He's like, and this guy has this, he's like 6'2", very wiry, strong-looking, scary-looking dude, wiry, gray hair. And he's, what do you want? I'm like, oh, uh, I've, I got a Volkswagen. And uh, it doesn't run. It's in my backyard. I, I bought it. And I got the carburetor, and I want to get the parts to fix the carburetor. That's all I wanted. But I brought the carburetor so you could see what I had. And he says, he looks at me. He goes, how old are you? I said, I'm, I'm 15. He's like, oh, come with me. So I follow him. We go into this room, and they got all these cardboard bins with numbers on them. 111, 113, all Volkswagen numbers, and then they'll have the Porsche number 6166 and 901, because it's very organized, like incredibly organized. Very German. Very, and, and <laughs> he's like, he reaches into the box, this is the kit, come with me. So I follow him, he takes me to a bench, and the bench is very well, it's very clean and nice, and on the wall are tools. He's like, take it apart, you know, take, take this apart and, uh, and let me know when you're done. Well, I'm like, Tara, I'm like, take it apart. Okay. So I just start taking tools. And I think I cut my hand. I slip with a screwdriver. You know, I'm a total novice. And I take the carburetor apart. Well, I think I have it apart. Right, yeah. And he comes over and he's like, oh. And he, like, did something. He took a clip off or something. He goes, all right, take, get the parts. Oh, no, he walked, he walked over and he came back with a metal basket. And he says, put everything in the basket. And I put everything in the basket, and they had this little air-powered bucket thing. And you hang, you would hang the basket, and then put it onto the bucket, and plug in the air. And there was a little knob, and he adjusted the knob, and it's just going back and forth, 
this air motor, you can hear it. This little pneumatic motor just, he goes, come back tomorrow, the parts will be clean. I'm like, okay. So I come back the next day, first thing. And he's like, okay. And he gets the basket out and that incredibly clean. It's like this chlorinated solvent that would dissolve flesh from bones, you know? I guess you can't even get it probably now. Really? The parts were so clean and like perfect. they look new. Like just incredible. And so, so it was just spraying this. No, no, it was shaking? submerged. So submerged. So the basket goes down in the solution. Oh, okay. And it, it just swishes back and forth. And he let it do that all night. Oh my God. So, I come back. I can only imagine and, what that was. And I'm thinking we're just going to build the carburetor, right? And oh, and mind you, this solvent is nasty shit, right? And I've got like baby hands. Of course you do. Not he's anymore. Got, yeah. But back then, I he, had baby yeah, hands, right? Soft little delicate hands. He's got hands like just. So he's like, all right. Uh, you have to rinse the pots and clean them. So I'm, he gives me a rag, some other shit, and shows me the blow, this nozzle to blow it. And I'm getting like, t- like totally saturated with fumes and chemicals. And my hands turned into like, like I have old man hands now. They look like that because of that. You know, it's like totally, when I went home, my hands were all cracked and turning red and drying. Just and bleeding little cracks on my <laughs> knuckles and shit. Jesus, John. But I was so happy. So, but then it got more fun because he's like, uh, check the, he's showing me things, like valuable things. Like he's like, you have to make sure it's flat. You know, it has to be flat. I'm like, it's flat. He goes, no. He goes, look. And he takes like the, the diaphragm housing on the carburetor. And he can hold it up to the light. I hold it up like, oh, I can see light. He goes, it's not flat. So he gets a piece of emery and puts it out on the bench. And he says, go like this. Until, and he picks it up, he goes, you see how it's shiny here and not here? He goes, when it's all shiny, you're done. So I'm going like, he says, don't, just go like this. I'm like, so I'm, so I'm doing this, and it's all shiny. And I'm like, oh, yeah, it's flat now. Well, I did that on every surface of the carburetor. Oh, boy. And so I had to do that first. But now there's like this, this uh, aluminum dust. So now you have to blow it out, make sure it's clean, more solvent, more air. <laughs> <laughs> my and my hands are screaming at me, but I'm so happy. And uh, he shows me the orientation of everything and how to assemble it and make sure the diaphragm and all that. You know, the spring. Anyways, I build my carburetor. Why do you think he took you in and did this? I don't know. We're still friends. He could have told you go to hell. He you could know, have. You're too young. Yep. Or where's your dad? Yep. Or leave it here and I'll take care of it, kid. Yes. But he showed you. Yes. A, a, I can never repay him for that. Other than if I call him and Herta to check on them tonight, I always tell them, whatever you need, let me know if you need anything. And they never ask for anything. But uh, there's still... He saw something, though. I suppose. This cute little kid with a carburetor on his bike and yeah, a like, this skull bag. Stupid like... kid. And, and I got to tell you, the, the things you heard in that shop when I got... Oh, you are so dumb. Oh, you are... You stupid... Like, so, not mean... Right. Now, if you tell a kid, he's, my own kids in my shop today, man, that is the stupidest. Oh, you know, it's right. <laughs> oh, man, it's, it's an emotional another. breakdown, and you got to yeah. have a get together. Sorry, right. Ian. Sorry, Patrick. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Anthony. Sorry, Victor. Uh, I love you all. But, but he wasn't saying it with, with mean intent. No. He was saying, oh, you're just dumb. Yeah. You, no, it's you know. not flat. Let me show you flat. Yeah. Look up into the light. Yeah. That's flat. Dumb. You're so, dumb. Yeah. <laughs> and absolutely and ignorant. Yeah, but you were yes. ignorant. Yes. You just didn't understand. Yeah. He showed you. And now for then you knew that was flat. Yes. So then he's like, where's the car? I'm like, what's... Well, and I'm like 14 blocks away. You know, he's like, well, remove the distributor. Bring the distributor. And did you know what that even was? I did. Okay. I did. So... I got the distributor and did this. We did the same process, so we rebuilt the distributor. We checked the weights and we put it in the machine and we checked the curve and we did all this stuff. And my mind is just, I'm just so- soaking it in. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah. And he's. Are ex- you feeling at this point you're in the right place? Oh, absolutely. I-, I wanted to work there, but I couldn't work there. Right, but you felt like if this was the center of the universe, you just walked into if it. If I could have dropped out of school at that moment and just been saturated by that, I would have been happy. Your life would have been complete as if you thought. I don't, in my head, and I was absolutely right. 
I didn't need school. I didn't need college. I didn't need any of that. This just fed you. Had I been able to just be immersed in that, which is kind of, uh, so I'll tell you, it's kind of what I did. So it's, it's fun how this all turned out. But I, piece by piece, with his help, got that car to run. Okay? Right. And it changed my life. And it gave me freedom. It gave me immense freedom. So I did everything. I got my driver's permit. I got insurance. I did everything I was supposed to do, except for obey traffic laws. (laughs) Okay? So I became the hellion of Southgate in my Beatles and my cars and my Camaros and street racing. And, and I pretty much had to leave Southgate because of my driving habits. At the end of the day, I couldn't drive anymore in Southgate. The cops would just pull me over to harass me. They just knew, but, Get him. but the reality is what color was that I Beetle? deserved it. I deserved it completely. It's like my boys now, especially my youngest one, if he gets pulled over, maybe he's, he's getting older now, so he gets it. But when he was younger, if he got pulled over, oh, cop pulled me over for no reason, man. All I do was a little burnout. It's like, oh, really? Like, so, you know, it's like that it travels. It what, travels. Color, what color was that beetle? Uh, it was about four colors. <laughs> it was yellow, red, white, and gray. Okay. Yeah. And, and by the time I sold it, it was a completely different car. It was uh, it was a race car. It was made for going fast in a straight line. By the time I got rid of it, um, and I transferred from that car into a '66 Ghia, and I got a '59 Alfa Romeo. Um, I ended up having like a little mini car collection. You're touched by the bug at this point, aren't oh. you? Uh, you know, it's so funny uh, uh, doing what you can with a little bit and not becoming a criminal is so hard. Like, How many cars did you have by the time you were like 20? Well, when I was 20, when I was 20, I had a Gia, a 66 Gia, a 68 Camaro, the 59 Alpha, and a, like a bicycle. I got a couple of bicycles, like BMX bikes and stuff right. like that. But that, that's, that was my collection at the time. And I had aspirations to have much more. But uh, I sold off the Gia because nobody would race me in it anymore. It already, it's, when you street race, uh, once your car does a certain way, it, it becomes a sucker bet. Right. So that car had become ineffective. So I'd moved on to the Camaro. And I was in love with the Alpha because the Alpha was a fun handling, fun car. And um, I didn't realize that... I didn't. What, I hadn't driven a Porsche really a lot yet. Uh, I had driven Mike's Porsches, and okay. I loved them, but they were unobtainable. I mean, forget about it. Um, the Alpha was a fun deal, but that that's a whole other story. Um, that was a really expensive car to have, and it broke all the time. And for everything I loved about the Alpha was erased by the 912. That's another story. But the um, the Camaro I built. The Camaro was fun. I I incrementally made that into a machine and I eventually it got wrecked um, but uh, I have to say I never wrecked a car people crashed into me and that's the truth <laughs> you know I'm, it's funny I mean I never really lost control of a car if I did I corrected or was lucky and never was lucky enough to always lose control of it land never well did. yeah so um, but uh, but if kids are listening we don't race cars <laughs> well, no, you can, you can race a car. We got it. They have outlets for yes, that. Yes, they do. They do. And you know, look, if if you're gonna go fast, be responsible. I got to tell you, right now during COVID, there's a bunch of assholes in cars that are doing things that are just irresponsible. And if you're in a shit box, going 110 miles an hour in traffic, because COVID kind of unleashed the beast early on during the first shutdown. Mm-hmm. I don't know if they're even going to hear this, but, you know, come on. Come on. Look, when, when you're by yourself in your car on ACH or Glendora or 
one of the canyons, and there's not any, and you're staying on your side of the WL line, and you're pushing the limit, and you eat it, and maybe you even leave the planet because of it, that's on you. But if you take out a family, right, or 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 end up being a, a, a burden to your family because you can't walk, you know, I, or you know, you're veg vegetable. It happens. It happens all the time. Sure. Um, but I gotta say, back then, uh, you know, rolling up on, on Mulholland and street racing, uh, where we did it over in uh, like uh, South Central, Compton, and uh, and uh, backside of Southgate and Linwood. It wasn't really that dangerous. Right. There was nobody around. Well, there was a bunch of us, but we were responsible about it. And nobody was pulling knives and guns on each other. And uh, it just, nobody was, look, we, we never, ever, ever did the things kids do now where they do an intersection takeover yeah. and do donuts. Because let me just say there was a, a, a silent agreement between the police and us as street racers. We didn't create grief for anyone. If somebody lost control of their car and smashed, we called a wrecker, drove the guy to St. Francis. <laughs> he got his leg, <laughs> got a cast or got stitches on his head. Uh -huh. Nobody died. It was, it was just our little subculture going on. And sometimes the cops would come hang out. It, it was fun, okay? But we knew that if we went out on Tweety Boulevard and started doing donuts in the intersection and messing up the street. Blocking traffic. It was, it was on, those cops would have beat our asses. Really, I'm serious. Oh, like, yeah. You'd beat have our asses. Beat down. I've had my ass beat by cops. Yeah. I'm telling and you right now. They would have destroyed the cars accidentally. Oh, my God. <laughs> I got, I got, I was uh, on Long Beach Boulevard in my Gia listening to Billy Idol, Rebel Yell. As loud as I could make it happen in my little car. My car was gutted, okay, completely gutted with a, with a fiberglass front end, centerline wheels, as light as it could be. But I still had a cassette deck and a Rockford amp <laughs> and some big-ass speakers in the back and a panel that were, like, bulletproof. I mean, because I was, drove like an idiot. But I would, little, I would race that car with the stereo. I was out of my mind. But I... Uh, went up to meet a girl who lived off of Long Beach Boulevard uh, there in Southgate mm -hmm. after where I worked. And uh, people used to jack cars back then. Like if you're in a bad neighborhood at night, people would get out and they'd, they would jack your car. Sure. Get out of the car. They have a knife or whatever. And uh, they take your car, leave you standing there. And my Gia was a pretty well-known little car. And I, I'm on Long Beach Boulevard, it's kind of late at night. And I cut through I cut through a gas station because it was a bus blocking my right hand turn, mm -hmm. just sitting there. So I cut through a gas station. Well, I came out of the gas station, and all of a sudden I see this car come out of the gas station that I didn't see, and it's following me. So I change lanes. It changed lanes. I change lanes again. It changed. I'm like, who the hell is this? And my stereo's blasting, <laughs> and I got you know, like you know shitty glass in the car, and all I see is like these two silhouettes in this sedan. And I'm like, they're gonna jack me. So I, I come up to a light and the door's open on the car. I'm like, oh, I'm gone. So I punch the car and I got these skinny little center lines in the front and the biggest meats I could fit in the back of the Gia. Right. It's not made for handling, but I'm decent at the wheel. I take off, blow through the red light. I looked, I'm like, oh, and there's nobody. So I go, I got, a, I got enough room to get through. So I blow the red. But there's traffic coming. Uh -huh. The car behind me just goes for it. All I see, I'm looking in my mirror, I see cars spinning out, like dust and shit, debris. I'm like, oh my God, cause an accident. But that car keeps going. I'm like, oh man. So I cut down some side streets and I'm driving as fast as I can. And so are they. And I turn on a, onto another side street heading towards Southern, which is the main thoroughfare that'll take you all, it's between Firestone and Imperial. Yeah, right. Southern is the main thoroughfare and it's a big wide street. And I'm, the top speed of my Kia was like 105 miles an hour, but it would do it really quick. Like, bah, bah, yeah, clo uh, the gears were really, it was a powerful little car. And I'm topped out as fast as the car would go. And I'm on Southern, it's hauling ass. Um, 
But I remember before I turned on to Southern, I saw something happen. I didn't know what it was. Well, what had happened was those cops, when I had turned on to that side street, they lost control. Oh, boy. And they were cops. It was cops in an unmarked car. It wasn't somebody trying to jack me. Right. So now I've got two detectives that were on some stakeout doing some thing, decided to be Superman. Right. Patrolman all of a sudden. And now they've watched me blow a red light, cause an accident. Now they've wrecked their car. (laughs) Jesus. And I'm going as fast as I can go down Southern. I just wanted to get to Alameda and get across into the projects and stuff and just disappear. Right. Get away. Just park and lay low. Maybe even leave the car there and run my ass back out and just leave it there. You know, like just dump it because that's where my head was at because um, I didn't want to get in trouble. I, oh, so it, because the reason I say that is because now there's lights. There's cops. There's cops coming. And I realized, you know what? I'm not going to win this. But I'll explain to them that a car was chasing me. That's where my head's at. Mm-hmm. I got cherries in front of me, cherries behind me, and I'm like, oh, shit. So I, I just pull over next to the dirt field on Southern and I wait for the cops to get there. And, man, they fan out, guns drawn. They're pissed. And I'm thinking, I'm just, I'll explain to them that I was being chased. Just keep, be cool. And all of a sudden I hear this, this, like, scraping, like, weird sound. It's this light blue car that was chasing me with a flat broken like a bent it was all like one of those funny cars (laughs) at the parade when you were a kid you had like different size wheels and it's all funky and offset smoky they drove in the damaged undercover car (laughs) Jesus and they're pissed and they had been on the radio and this guy's name was Robert Meyer Detective Meyer and the other detective was Judy Majors and they wanted to kill me. <laughs> no, I'm serious. They were so angry. And he comes, the Rob, the Rob, Detective Meyer, he came running. And he had a big gun. And they told me to put my hands up and out of that car, which I did. And then it's, it was a long night. Let me show you, it's a long night. I had long hair. That he pulled me out of that car. He opened the door and pulled me out of that car by my hair. Well, at least he opened the door. Yeah. <laughs> but they dislocated both my shoulders. They took my car completely apart, broke the Zeus fasteners. Oh, Jesus. You know, just dist- and I, I got saved by the watch commander. His name was Terry McWeeny. Terry, Terry McWeeny was a longtime car buff and, like, president of car clubs back in the day. He was, he was a greaser, but he was also the cop. And he heard my name come over because he knew who I was. And he came, he saved me. He saved me. And because that was going to be the longest, maybe the last night. I mean, it was bad. It was bad. They, they, they were very upset with me. But I know what it's like to piss off the cops and get your ass beat. I, I know what that feels like. And, and I, I mean, literally, I had to go to the hospital the next day. They, they, they tore my shoulders. I had to, they messed me up. That's part one of our conversation with John Benton. This is Matt Brown, and you listen to Just a Good Conversation. Please hit the subscribe button as well as the like button. You can always follow us on Instagram and Twitter, as well as the website, justagoodconversation.com. Thank you for listening.